So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our clergy conversations at St. Paul's in Chestnut Hill. And we are very honored to have a panel of healthcare experts with us today. And it's about a year ago when we started talking in church about something strange is going on. And we thought we should uh, use our practice in communion differently and be a little more cautious. And we didn't really know what was coming down the down the pike and a year later, almost to the week, um, we are here in the midst of COVID-19. So we thought it was really appropriate to bring some people in to help us uh, kind of ask the questions that we all have. The good news, uh, we have uh, now three vaccines. We, I'm sure there'll be questions about that, but let me begin by just welcoming our panel and thanking them for their time and also their service uh, we pray for you and give thanks for the work that you're all doing. It is very, very challenging work right now. Uh, so thank you uh, for all you do and your colleagues. Please let them know that uh, they're in our thoughts and prayers. Um, Robert Whitaker, if you just put your hand up. Uh, Bob is a member of St. Paul's, but uh, he is also Director of Research and Research Education, Columbia Bassett Program, Professor of Clinical Pediatrics and Vagilos College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University. So Bob, welcome. Uh, Najia Mahmood is with us and Najia is the Chief Division of Colon and Rectal Surgery. Emil and Roland T. De Hillebrandt, Professor of Surgery, Professor of Surgery and Obstetrics and Gynecology, University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Najia. Mile Petrov is the Senior Information Technology Project Manager with the Thomas Jefferson University Hospitals. Um, you know, Mile is my husband. And so it's been really, he's been working from home for the last year. So we certainly know what many of our healthcare providers are going through. And finally, Neil Fishman. Dr. Neil Fishman is the Chief Medical Officer of the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So Neil, thank you for being with us. So let me begin. Uh, first of all, we're going to let the panel talk for a little so you get a sense of where they're coming from, um, how COVID-19 has impacted their uh, practices and their professional lives. And so we'll be asking them a couple of questions to begin with, but please put your questions in the chat. And after we've had a, a chance to hear from the panel, we'll go back and answer, um, uh, attempt to answer some of your questions. So my first question to the panel is, we are now entering our second year of dealing with COVID-19 with over half a million Americans uh, lost uh, to this disease. And my question is, how has this year changed your personal and professional lives? I think this would be a really good way for you to talk about your expertise and how this chapter we're in now, how's that changing the way uh, you are living, you are practicing and those of your institutions? And maybe why don't we start with uh, Najia, would you like to begin? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Albert. Uh, it is a real honor to be here today for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy, happy to be here, happy to address the congregation at St. Paul's. Uh, so, you know, it's been a rough year uh, for healthcare providers. And I think I am uh, among those who've had a, a sort of a difficult time. I'm a surgeon. Uh, so uh, many of the patients that I, um, I interact with need to come into the hospital or stay at the hospital for lengthy periods of time while they're recovering. Uh, so that has uh, really uh, impacted uh, the patients' lives and, and my own. Uh, <clears throat> after an initial uh, uh, di diminishment, we, we actually, at Penn, we actually restricted uh, certain surgical diagnoses uh, initially way back in uh, March. March 15th, I believe, was the date where we said, uh, we have a real problem. Let's, uh, let's uh, cut down on elective uh, hip replacements and things like that. Um, uh, since I'm a colorectal surgeon, I continue to operate on people who do ha did have cancer, do have cancer, and uh, bowel obstructions and things that were imminently uh, dangerous. 
Um, but patients could not have family members visiting them, so they were alone in the hospital. And, uh, you know, I think that it, all, it was imperative for us as caregivers to step up our uh, day-to-day contact with those patients uh, so that they weren't so alone. And we really felt that uh, as uh, members of a team with our advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, residents, interns, medical students. We, we actually asked the medical students to stay home uh, last March and, and the medical students couldn't uh, participate in patient care uh, for a very lengthy period, for months. Uh, it really impacted their education at Penn and I'm sure at many other places as well. We wanted to keep them out of harm's way as non-essential providers. Uh, so it was a really different experience. I think that one of the key things as a as a practitioner, as a physician that came out of this for me was the discovery of uh, telehealth, right? Uh, doing things by Zoom, doing things by uh, by by computer. And I would say that this has this is not something, this technology is not something that's going to go away. I think that both patients and physicians and practitioners have embraced it as um, kind of a new normal. I think it's a very appropriate, it's very appropriate for many, um, for many diagnoses and many kinds of office visits, but not for every office visit. As a surgeon, I have to do physical examinations frequently on patients who have complaints. So for those patients, it's better to have an in-office evaluation. But for many patients, it has, it has had great benefits for them if they live a distance, if they're fearful or anxious about driving into the city, saves parking fees, congestion around the, the pen, that, that big hub you know, complex in West Philadelphia has been greatly reduced, and yet we're still able to serve patients and patients get their questions answered. So I think that there have been, if you can talk about a silver lining, I think that that has been one. But I'll stop there. And, uh, transfer to your point about technology, maybe, Mila, can you talk about how this has impacted uh, your work and people you're working with? Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, I can certainly talk. Obviously, as an IT project manager, we were very heavily involved to support all the various initiatives that Nanji as a practitioner provided they need to put in place. So obviously, we had to reprioritize a lot of our project, things that were kind of in the line. We had to kind of put them on the back burner and really reprioritize all the various COVID initiatives. And that is increasing the capacity in the hospitals, providing during the surge, you know, overflow units, putting in place new procedures and protocols of care, things that were kind of new. So all of that obviously needed to be kind of enabled in the various softwares to support. We also had to, in order to support all this transition of people working remote or enabling Zoom, like to stand up the infrastructure to support. So obviously all the internet, in order now, all of a sudden we used to have maybe like 2000 people working remote, all of a sudden you have 15,000 people working remote. So all of that obviously needed to be put in place to support it, you know, um, then enabling the various patients or increasing sign up to use telehealth, you know, my chart and so forth so that they can get, you know, access to the providers. And in a lot of ways, then helping, especially folks in assisted living or older folks, which are kind of the key demographics, you know, navigating through the intricacies like, you know, for some people, it may be easier to say, okay, go sign up, go on the internet and do this. But for some people, that's still a little bit of a challenge and trying to enable them to, to get those services taken care of. So um, those were some of the main things that we really worked from technology side to enable. Thanks, Mila. And so, Bob, you, you've been, your career, you've followed a lot of pediatric and mental health. Do you want to talk a little bit more focused on what you're seeing. You, Bob, can you un unmute? Thank you. Thanks for having me, Albert. I wanted to acknowledge uh, that uh, I've been at, been at St. Paul since 2009, along with my wife, Hillary Burdett, my daughter, Luella. I wanted to thank my 
neighbor and fellow parishioner Van for coaxing me to participate today. Um, you know, before I was in my current position, I worked at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I also worked at Seattle Children's Hospital providing patient care to children and families, working with residents and medical students. Um, then I entered a phase of my career mostly involved with public health research. Um, I taught uh, graduate courses in public health and epidemiology and social epidemiology for 10 years at Temple. And my work now is really focused largely on research, although I still work with medical students. And the thing that's been very interesting about the pandemic for me is how it's interacted with the themes of my research um, about how social factors affect health over the life course. And I've been particularly interested in various forms of adversity like social inequality and emotional trauma and many things that are really coming to light in the pandemic. And I'm interested in how these challenges affect not only the health of children, but their whole family systems and particularly how uh, children manage to grow into adults that flourish despite these kind of challenges. And so the pandemic has put a really interesting lens on all of that uh, for me, both personally, but also in my work. And I, I think the two main themes that have really com come to light are just how important uh, our relationships are with other people and also how um, important our relationship with technology is. Um, I, I, I sense that we'll come out of this both as individuals and in my case as a scientist with kind of a renewed sense about the importance of the social connection to all aspects of health and particularly the importance of social connection to children's education and their development. I think we're really understanding in, in a sometimes painful way, I think, how, how there's such enormous inequities in health and healthcare. And I think the last thing is, is that the pandemic has really kind of reinforced to us that there's probably not a meaningful distinction between the health of the body and the health of the mind. They're, they're quite interconnected. Um, so this morning, if people have questions about how social forces interact with our biology, that's kind of an area I'm greatly interested in. Or if you have general questions about how the pandemic is, is impacting uh, uh, children and families um, as kind of social and biologic uh, units, I, I would be happy to, to talk about those things too. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. So, so Neil, what's, what's your take? You have a uh, pan big responsibility. Um, what's your sense of, of uh, things that, that have changed? Um, you're, you're, and, and again, we're lucky in Philadelphia to have so many resources. Where, where, where do you see, look back and then look forward to where you see this going? First of all, thank you for inviting me today. It's an honor to be here. Um, I am, uh, as, as Albert said, I'm the, the chief medical officer at the hospital. I'm also an infectious disease physician. Um, so in, in addition to help organizing the hospital to deal with COVID-19, um, I've also uh, done a lot of care for patients um, with COVID-19. Um, as, as the chief medical officer, I've been... Um, fortunate to be part of a very large team that has um, essentially rebuilt certain areas of the hospital to provide care for COVID patients, um, organized care, uh, and, and a very dedicated team that has spent a, a lot of hours and devoted their time uh, and overtime uh, to, to caring. Sometimes um, we, I, I think, focus on the providers um, what, what has been very gratifying is to see how other members of our team um, really, really chipped in. It became more obvious how integral um, they were to the, um, to the care of these individuals. Um, our environmental service workers, for instance, back in March, um, were very courageous in, in going into these patients' rooms to clean them when we didn't know a, a lot about the disease or, or how it was transmitted. Our facilities and, and hospital engineers rebuilt certain areas of the hospital and worked 24 seven to do it. Um, our, the people who 
delivered food to the patients, again, had to be, were, were brave and, and walked into the room. Uh, and it's been very gratifying um, to see really everyone banding together and, and working together um, as part of that team. More recently, we, we've done the same to, um, to launch our vaccine program uh, initially for healthcare providers um, and now for patients. Um, as, as a physician, as an infectious disease physician, um, I've seen far too many people die alone. Um, I've, um, I've seen far too many families grieve alone. Um, and I've seen the impact um, on my colleagues uh, and the hospital staff, it's been, it's been very, um, very straining. I don't think last March anyone thought we would still be at this a year later. Um, people are tired, um, and uh, but still working hard, um, and and still being very agile and nimble to address the needs of, of the community and and as Bob said, the needs of each other. Um, that's been one of the more gratifying things to see how people band together um, and, and support each other. Um, um, you know, I've seen the impact on our children and their education and, and of course, on, on the economy. Um, and um, that's been, um, um, it, it's been trying. It's, been, it's trying for everyone, uh, everyone in the hospital. Um, with respect to uh, where we are going, I think the, um, the vaccines are, are the light at the end of the tunnel that we've been waiting for. Uh, unfortunately, we're not quite sure how long that tunnel is yet as, as we still struggle with vaccine uh, availability and vaccine distribution, uh, not to mention vaccine hesitancy, uh, which, we can, uh, which we can also talk about. Um, and um, uh, as you said, we do, we are fortunate that we live in an area that has uh, access to healthcare. Um, there are many areas of the country that don't have the access that we do. Um, there are some areas of the city that don't have the, you know, the access that, uh, that other areas of the city have. Um, and, um, and, and the other thing that, uh, that I, I struggle with personally um, and that um, others I, I'm sure struggle with is that I do think that, um, that the pandemic has highlighted um, inequities and disparities in healthcare um, in the city and across the country and also the impact of, uh, of systemic racism. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that uh, and to um, and to address that. Uh, let, me, let me go back and maybe just open this to the whole panel. Um, you know, we, we are very lucky in Philadelphia uh, because of the work that you're all doing. Uh, and we compare that to other, uh, other co communities. What, what do you think that means for your, you know, Penn and Jefferson going forward and particularly around co community health in general? Uh, Albert, uh, in terms of community health in general, I, uh, I can certainly speak for Penn in that we have uh, many, pro we have recognized that the health of the community is, 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 is of paramount importance. And there are many programs that do community outreach and they are exceedingly wide ranging. You know, you're talking about specifically COVID-19. There are initiatives, for example, there are initiatives through, through CHOP um, to vaccinate all the teachers in the city of Philadelphia. So that's a well-known initiative. It's, you know, it started a few weeks ago and, you know, their, their program, their mission is to vaccinate uh, 500 teachers a day. Uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so I think that there's uh, been a real emphasis and maybe a, maybe the light has shined just a little bit brighter on the 
hospital community connection in the wake of or uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. So even things like uh, screenings, encouraging people to get out there and get screenings for diseases like breast cancer and colorectal cancer and prostate cancer, things that may have fallen off during the pandemic. We have community outreach initiatives that have re-engaged with the community around these aspects of community health. So there are ample opportunities to ramp up our, our community uh, outreach and engagement efforts. And I think and, and I know we have, you know, I, I you know, we per, I'm personally involved in efforts like that to both the community at large, as well as to your point, Albert, the underserved community. Uh, Penn has a great relationship with community groups in West Philadelphia in particular. Um, and my, you know, expertise is in colorectal surgery and colorectal cancer. So we do that quite, quite a lot in the West Philly community. Um, but I, you know, it's a, it's, it, this is a real opportunity for us to, to serve in ways that, uh, to, to, in ways that we have been, but, um, uh, with, with a little bit more emphasis on, on the pandemic. There's, uh, it's, uh just to add on to Nadia's comments, um, we were talking a little about this before the program started, but, um, one of the one of the impacts of the pandemic uh, that's affected all communities and, and, and maybe more so the underserved communities is that people have been afraid to go to their doctors and to, and to hospitals to get routine care. Um, and um, in addition to the direct impact of the pandemic, uh, we're starting to see um, people dying from heart disease who shouldn't have. Um, if they had gotten care earlier. Uh, people with, in Nagia's case, delayed diagnoses of, of colon cancer because they were afraid to get their screening colonoscopies or had symptoms that they were afraid to address. Um, you know, not, that, not too long ago, we had a 19-year-old a who came in with a ruptured appendix and was septic because his um, his, he and his mom were afraid to come to the hospital when he had a fever and, and, and very bad abdominal pain. Um, so it's important for us to, um, first of all, to make our um, healthcare settings safe uh, for patients, but more importantly, to communicate to the communities um, that it is safe um, to, to continue to get healthcare. Um, and that we will uh, we will protect them. So let me let me move uh, the conversation a little bit into the conversation about vaccines, and we know you know we're trying to ramp that up and so on. So what what would be your advice to somebody? I mean, there are two groups: one, people who are not sure they want to take the vaccine, so questions about safety, and then people who certainly have their shots but now want to start hugging their grandchildren. Where where are we on that spectrum of uh, of safety? Who would like to who would like to respond to that? It's probably my uh, it's probably in my wheelhouse. Uh, okay, go ahead. Um, Neil. Um, so um, I would um, so there there are now three vaccines um, that are available as of last evening. Um, the the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccines are, are messenger RNA vaccines. Um, there has been some criticism that, there, that it is a, they are new vaccines that have not been adequately studied and, and that could not be further from the truth. Um, the technology um, behind these vaccines and these vaccines in general have been in development and have been studied for at least 12 years. Um, and, uh, and their safety had been demonstrated before the vaccine uh, for COVID-19 was developed. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine that was approved last night is, um, uses um, what's called an adenovirus vector. It's, it's, a, it's a virus that doesn't cause disease in humans, but can, but can help deliver the the protein, the, the COVID protein in, in order to develop an immune response. 
that technology has also been developed for many, many years. Um, the only way, um, I, I think the vaccines are the only way to control this, uh, control this pandemic. Um, I think they are um, safe, they are effective. Um, I, have, um, I have been immunized. Um, my wife has been immunized. Um, my 24 year old daughter, um, who's a, a medical student has been immunized. Um, and uh, my 21 year old son hasn't because he's young and healthy and in college. And uh, the minute there is an opportunity to, um, for him to get immunized, he will roll up his sleeve and, and get in line as fast as he can. Um, the, the one other thing I'll address is there have been some questions about the um, the J and J vaccine compared to the other vaccines. Uh, people focus on the um, on the fact that um, it is sixty six percent effective in preventing disease compared to ninety to ninety five percent for the other two vaccines. Uh, that's the wrong number to focus on. The important number to focus on is that the J&J &J vaccine uh, is 100% effective in preventing severe disease, in preventing hospitalization, and in preventing death. Uh, additionally, the J&J &J vaccine only requires one injection, um, and it's much easier to store uh, than the Moderna vaccine uh, and particularly the Pfizer vaccine. So it makes it much easier vaccine to deliver to the community. So let me ask the other members of the panel, um, uh, just in terms of, you know, people have been Im immunized, but when can they start getting back to normal, uh, visiting other members of their families? What's your advice on, on uh, how to move forward from here? Well, I, Albert, I just wanted to, to add something on to what Neil was saying regarding uh, vaccine hesitancy. Um, and, uh, and then maybe I'll uh, ask <laughs> Neil to uh, uh, talk about the return to normal or normalcy in the era of vaccination. Um, so uh, I think that we all have a role as healthcare providers to encourage those around us in the hospital and outside the hospital to engage with the vaccine. Um, I see it every day in the hospital. Uh, Neil had alluded to the fact that uh, the hospital is a great micro, uh, macrocosm, really. It's like a community within a community, really. And there are people from all different backgrounds and all different socioeconomic levels, all different education levels, uh, all different races and creeds and religions who work together as a team. And I think we have been functioning as a team very well. But one thing that has become very, very evident to all of us who work there is that there are members of the team that are very, very hesitant to take the vaccine or engage with the vaccine or have different beliefs about the virus than, than, than we do. I have seen personally that our advocacy for vaccination, the advocacy on, on the, the, by the physicians and has really affected and moved the needle on the acceptance of the vaccine from by others whom we work with. And I've seen that in the operating room. Uh, when the vaccine first rolled out, uh, there were many uh, people in who work in the operating room who I work with every day who are a member of my own personal team who were refusing to take the vaccine. And you know, a few weeks later, everybody was in line to take the vaccine. And we really um, encouraged each other, supported each other, and made sure that everybody felt safe taking the vaccine by uh, giving them accurate and real information about the vaccine, not just rumors and mythology and really modeling good behavior uh, and appropriate behavior. So I think that we can do a lot for each other in terms of encouraging each other to take the vaccine and dispelling rumors around uh, the issues with the vaccine that they may see on the internet or hear from their neighbor, et cetera. 
Um, in terms of when is it safe to hug your grandchildren uh, and what do we have to do moving forward? I think that yesterday when we were on our pre-meeting call, I think we all acknowledged and agreed that we will all be wearing face masks, vac vaccinated or not, for a long time coming. I know that at Hospital University of Pennsylvania, we have no plans to stop wearing face masks to protect each other and to protect ourselves. But maybe Neil can elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, thank you, Najee. The, um, the, there, there are two things we don't know about the vaccines. Um, we don't know how long they last and we won't for a while until we do ongoing testing to see how long the immune response lasts. And we don't know yet if people can get um, develop asymptomatic infections or get what we would call colonized with the virus um, and still be able to transmit it even though they don't get sick from the virus. Uh, and until we have the answers to those questions. I think it's going to be critical to, um, to continue to wear masks. The other, um, the other issue um, that plays into this is that not everyone is vaccinated. A very small percentage of the community is vaccinated. Um, so if given what I just said, if, an un, if a vaccinated person doesn't wear a mask, they, there is the risk that they could transmit infection to an unvaccinated person, uh, even, even though they are not ill themselves. Um, so I think for the foreseeable future, um, we, will be, we will be wearing masks um, until a much larger portion of the population is vaccinated. Um, that, has, uh, that does have a significant impact on people. I'm sure that's something Bob has, uh, has been dealing with in the, in the, the children and the, the research that he deals with. You know, one thing I, I wanted to say about the public health challenge here is that there are um, many people who are not hesitant, who are eligible, who are still not vaccinated. And this is, a, this is a unfortunate and it, it, um, it falls along lines of a, a relative disadvantage. And one of the paradoxes in the whole situation is, I think, that there was a very thoughtful um, approach to deciding vaccine prioritization, but it turned out it was also um, as complicated to um, implement as it was thoughtful. And so the, the, the conundrum I think we got into was that um, it ended up actually in some ways compounding an injustice that it was intended to subvert. And by that, I mean that um, and this is where technology comes in, is that it was very, people were relying a lot on technology to reach the people who were most in need, but because of um, sort of the well-known uh, technology gap that exists across social class, age, and race, <laughs> uh, it was oftentimes very difficult to get the vaccine to people who were eligible. So. Much to people's surprises, there's some states now, Connecticut, for example, that have actually tried to um, initiate new plans that are less complicated, might that are age-based primarily at this point, that may seem less just, but on the other hand, um, uh, may actually be more just in so far as um, uh, it's, it's not hard for people to show up with their driver's license and prove that they're eligible. <laughs> So it, it's a very complicated thing sometimes when we try to do well in medicine, but technology is involved. We have to realize that wherever technology is involved, we have a, a chance to create inequity. And this is just a real challenge that uh, we're learning with this uh, rollout right now. Thanks, Bob, for that. So let me ask uh, Mile, uh, those of us who haven't been vaccinated yet, so there is... Where, where do you go? And I know you've got some resources uh, that you want to share in the chat window where people can go um, and uh, just invite people if you'd like to ask the panelists a question to put them in the chat window now so that Dan can uh, report those back to us. But Mile, um, any sense of uh, what are the best ways for us to get connected to the vaccine track? 
Yeah, definitely. So usually, as I said, once we kind of help people set them up with whatever applications or access to get in touch with the provider, usually the next question is when I'm going to get my vaccine. And unfortunately, it's one of those questions that we don't have direct answer. And, and as, you, as you folks probably already know, there is no uniform plan across the country that addresses exactly how things will happen. So basically, first and foremost, what we tell people, you need to go with your respective healthcare provider resource and register for the vaccine. Basically, with that, you express intent that when the time comes that you are willing and you agree to take the vaccine. And then obviously then depending how the CDC kind of sets up the general rules then goes down to the state and then from the state goes to the respective areas and one of the main challenge is the supply. So as we know, even though everyone would like to get the vaccine, there's only so much to go around and CDC along with the state kind of sets up the rule who the next year of patients are, usually it goes with the elderly, uh, it goes with patients with certain comorbidities or pre-existing factors like, you know, if you have like heart fail, you know, congestion or COPD and so forth, that like they probably should be the next in line. And I think, you know, Dr. Fishman and Dr. Mahmoud can talk more about it, but basically those are some of the criteria. And while well, I'm just posting a small sample of those resources that will also have more in-depth, you know, information, let me know if you guys see all of those. So basically those are various either CDC or Pennsylvania Department of Health, you know, resources in the respective, you know, uh, key counties around the Philadelphia, where basically each county kind of, you can go and see some of the rules and also there you can register and so forth. So, but I don't know if any of the folks that are involved or Dr. Fishman, if you have any other thoughts there. Um, I, I think the uh, the resources um, are there. They go. You put all you put all of the significant ones up there. Um, the resources are helpful. Um, everyone. Uh, I mean, the the truth is, you know, we we'd all like to be like Oprah here and say, "You get a vaccine, and you get a vaccine, and you get a vaccine." Um, but we we won't be able to do that until the supply uh, until the supply improves. Um, there are some indications now that um, the supply will be significantly more prevalent by May. Um, and so we're, we're getting close. Um, and I, I think, um, and uh, particularly with the introduction of the new J&J the new &J vaccine, um, the, there, is, there has been a, a lot of confusion in, in our area because some of the criteria vary from county to county. For instance, Philadelphia used different criteria than the state. Uh, we were, Philadelphia was more restrictive uh, and really just opened last week to a lot of the other at-risk populations, uh, and that limited uh, that limited ability to vaccinate people. People are very um, the counties um, are um, somewhat possessive about their vaccine and want to make sure that vaccine within counties uh, is used to vaccinate people in that county. And then finally, uh, I don't know if people have read the, the inquiry this morning, but it's something we've been aware of, that the vaccine distribution throughout the state's been very inequitable. Um, I can, you know, Philadelphia uh, has gotten about 21 thousand or 22,000 vaccines for every 100,000 of population. Uh, Delaware County's gotten about 9,000, Montgomery County about 14,000, but there's some smaller counties throughout the state, uh, very small counties that have gotten 45,000 uh, vaccines per 100,000. Um, and th those are listed in the, uh, in the article this morning. So I think there, there are a lot of, we still need to address or government still needs to address a lot of the policies and procedures and vaccination in order to make uh, the vaccine more widely available and to make distribution more equitable. Thank you so much. So we're now going to open uh, the discussion up. Um, there may be questions that uh, you can put in the chat or you can also ask directly. Dan, I just wanted to ask you, do you see any particular questions or themes that are coming out that you'd like to direct to the panel? Yeah, I'm, 
I'm going to ask a question that I have first. Um, I am a recent graduate of HUP's clinical pastoral education program. And so thank you for um, supporting that program, Dr. Fishman. And I just had a question. I finished up right before the pandemic started. So I'm sure the world has changed a lot for hospital chaplains. But uh, what role has chaplaincy and interfaith spirituality played in supporting staff through some of the trauma that's been going on um, as that healthcare providers are facing? Yeah, they, they played they played a critical role, Dan, um, and uh, it's been it's been a, a very important role. Um, we, I mean, I, I don't know how long you were at um, you were at at Penn, but um, we. You know, we've recognized recognized the critical role of of our faith leaders in the hospital um, for a long time. I could go I could go back to our response to um, to Ebola um, and and just the strain on preparation that that had on uh, on people, where people would just break down uh, and cry. Uh, and the um, uh, and, I, and I'm sorry if I, I didn't point this out earlier, but our um, uh, our faith leaders in the hospital, our chaplain group, have been just as just as critical a part of our team uh, as everyone else. They've been um, um, they have been um, providing comfort both to our and counsel both to our staff uh, as well as to patients. Um, unfortunately, with respect to patients, it's usually from outside the room. Um, we're going to start re now that the chaplains have been immunized. We're, we're going to look at that policy and uh, and, uh, and and readdress it. Uh, but it's it's been a critical role. One of the nice things um, I saw this several times last week is um, some of the um, uh, a nursing a nurse actually called a chaplain and asked them to visit uh, visit a provider team that was having a particularly bad day. Um, and that's that's something I, I didn't see that often prior to a, prior to COVID. So a team was rounding, having a bad day, and suddenly one of the chaplains showed up and said, just wanted to check in and see how you were doing. And you know they had a five or ten minute discussion, but it was uh, it was very helpful. So it's it's been a critical, um, critical and indispensable role uh, in our uh, our COVID response. Thanks, thanks for sharing. I had a wonderful experience and felt that there was a very intentional effort to include the chaplains as part of the care team. So glad to hear that's that's continuing through COVID. Well, Dan, I think it's also important to realize that, uh, you know, we really do consider the faith uh, providers, uh, providers and essential workers as well, right? You know, it's because they've got a critical role in supporting our teams and our patients. Uh, and through this pandemic, uh, uh, the, that the faith team has been incredibly important. So it's, it's, a, it's a great story, Neil. I'm going to pivot to some questions from the chat. Someone was asking about uh, long haul COVID and what what we know about the potential impact of that. Is can anyone speak to um, what we know about about how that is impacting people? And, and is there any new discoveries we're learning about the long term effects of especially people who um, you know survived COVID early on? Yeah, it's, um, we don't know a lot. Um, what we do know is that there are a group of people um, they are called long haulers. Um, and the one thing we do know is that it's not due to ongoing infection. Uh, it's likely due to their body's response to the infection. Um, but we don't know why um, this has impacted um, more people or cert certain populations and don't know what the risk factors are. There appear to be some similarities to chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and, um, and, but that is also an evolving field. I, I see Bob nodding. I'm wondering if he has any, uh, any comments. Well, I, I, I know I, I agree with you. I, uh, 
my wife Hillary and I, who she, Hillary's a pediatrician as well, we were talking about this recently, and I, I think we have seen um, many infections, um, some from viruses that are not as common as this, um, cause something equivalent to the long haul syndrome. But um, it, it, we don't. Uh, we, we haven't been able to understand exactly if there's a particular link to a type of infection or whether or not this really represents something more about how the host or the person's immune system adapts to the infection. I suspect it's probably the latter. And so we're seeing a lot of long haulers here related to COVID because we've had a lot of COVID infection. And so people are connecting those things. I think what remains really interesting is what is it that sets somebody's immune system up to uh, get in this chronic engagement with the virus even after the storm has sort of passed. <laughs> and this, this is a very interesting thing in all of stress response. What, what, what happens to the body's immune system when the stress abates? Um, and this is a very interesting thing for children who grow up in chronic stress, because what we realize is that a lot of them, even when that stress abates, can, their immune systems continue to be in a very aroused state that has um, implications for their health over the life course. So uh, what's the bottom line? I think the immune system needs to find itself in a sweet spot somehow where it gets uh, to business when business needs to be done and then pulls back a little bit when that's over. And there's a lot we don't understand about that, but I hope that um, when we study this long haul situation, we'll begin to really understand the bigger picture of how our immune system gets turned off, turned on and learns to turn itself off at the right time. Because I think the failures to turn your immune system off have a lot of implications for a lot of chronic adult diseases, diseases, including cardiovascular disease and dementia and all the big things that probably have a big inflammatory response component to them that reflects uh, a long-term hypervigilance almost of the immune system mm -hmm. to stress. That's my own view. No, I, I can't agree more, uh, Bob. Uh, there's ample evidence in other diseases, like, for example, in my world, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, has a profound effect on the cardiovascular system. So prolonged exposure to inflammation uh, or inflammatory meteors uh, circulating in the blood and in your system can have profound effects on uh, different systems. For example, your cardiovascular system that has nothing to do really with your bowel. We've known this for, for years and years. You know, people like me who, you know, interact with patients more episodically and less longitudinally, you know, uh, are going to be affected uh, or our decisions for care are gonna be affected by the results of these long haul uh, stress type symptoms that the long haul COVID-19 patients are exhibiting. So, you know, I think we're all as healthcare providers, no matter what we do, are gonna be entering into sort of a brand new world. We're gonna have to be very thoughtful as we go along and we're gonna have to gather data, right? You know, we're going to have to study this problem to figure out uh, what the best course of action is, um, but it's going to affect us all. Yeah, there, one other final comment I'll say, there are programs around the city uh, that have uh, that have been started to to care for patients, for the, these long haul patients. I know Penn has one. Neely, I'm pretty sure Jefferson has one also, um, and um, they offer access to a, a variety of different clinicians. But the, interestingly, at least anecdotally, um, the the intervention that I've seen that's been uh, most effective to date is actually physical therapy. Um, in, in helping these patients, these individuals uh, get back to it, to their normal, normal life. So could I ask a question here at this point? Can, um, to the doctors who are <laughs> with us, uh, long haul uh, right now seems for, in, in the current discourse to focus on people who got COVID-19 and who have symptoms that endure 
And there are a few of those and those numbers are increasing. Um, long haul, it turns out, um, it goes way beyond COVID-19. And there are viruses out there um, that have these persistent symptoms. Just one example, um, I don't know what you can see on your screen, um, but over my right shoulder um, is my younger daughter who had cytomegalovirus at age 11 and who still has symptoms uh, that have um, up, upended her life uh, for 20 years. She's 31 years old now. And what's, in, what's so interesting about what we're learning about the long haul with COVID-19 is that there, there's a variety of symptoms that persist and different people have different symptoms that persist. And, and Charlotte's symptoms are, which have persisted over 20 years, map on all of those. So there's, there's, a, there's a very interesting, complex, and um, in, in, in some ways uh, difficult uh, set of situations here that hopefully, now that there's this increasing awareness of the long haul problem and a lot of uh, attention being focused on, hopefully we'll begin to understand something about what can be done, what kinds of interventions can, can help people who have these long-term symptoms. There's also another, if I could ask a question, um, there's also going to be, in, to my mind, in the future, uh, repercussions from people who have not necessarily had the disease, but that have actually been almost isolated for, better, for a year or more, as we're doing now, and getting out again and how to sort of reintegrate them because they, you, you kind of learn to live in a shell in a way. And it, it's a funny feeling sometimes. And uh, I, I just, I know there, you know, and there's a lot of this is true, of course, in the retirement communities where people have been totally out isolated from anybody from the outside. They can see each other inside, but they can't sit for dinner or lunch or anything like that. So they're, they're confined to their apartments for the most part and the television and Zoom, thank God. But, um, and you know, there's going to be a lot of re-entry psychologically and all for a lot of those patients as well, because um, life just isn't going to go on and be the same again. And we're going to be masked and down here in Florida. If I go over to the shopping street here, which is just teeming with people, and I say 90% of them no masks, and you're, you're passing very closely to people and all, and you, you just can't, you know, it, it's... Uh, it suddenly has shut you away in a way. I mean, I, I shouldn't complain about it because I'm not, but I think for a lot of people, that's going to be hard to overcome and for them not to be nervous to go out. And, you know, my daughter's always saying, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. And, you know, this, this begins to get to one psychologically. So there's, there's going to be people who are going to need help with that type of thing as well, as we, as we start to come out of this, which I don't think I think it's gonna take us, well, I don't think we'll feel, I wonder if we'll be free to really do what we wanna do even by next year, by next fall. I mean, you know, and that's, I've been, I've been shutting this apartment down here pretty much for a year now. And it feels very funny and very strange. I haven't had anybody in, you know, haven't any, anybody for dinner or anything like that or gone to anybody else. One or two now I'm beginning to because of getting vaccinated, which is good. But I think it's going to be a strange world to come back into for a lot of people. And people are going to need help, I think, with it. I don't know how anybody else feels about that, but I think there's some work to be done in that arena. Going to be some work to be done in that arena. I appreciate so much what you're saying there. You know, as you talk, I'm kind of reminded of a child going to school for the first time, <laughs> you, you know, we're all very compassionate about what that feels like to enter that really big complicated world. And of course, it seems odd to think adults should have such anxiety, but after being separated for so long, our social brains get out of practice. And one of the things we learn to do as adults is to really tune our approach and withdrawal system, you know, 
which is really what is engaged in our brains when we're out looking at people. And we rely a lot on information provided by the entire face. <laughs> um, and so, so this is a very challenging thing for people. And I think you're really courageous to mention it. And I would say that, um, that self-compassion and other compassion are really the best approach to realize that these uh, social engagements are going to be really hard for some people. And we can't prejudge how they um, react or respond in those situations. And so maybe we just have to give one another, likely would a young child going to kindergarten for the first time, <laughs> more, more latitude in the range of kind of responses uh, they might have. Edie, you're on mute, if you're speaking. Edie, you're muted. Can you unmute? Can patient, 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 as we say. Well, well, we could carry that on later if it. Okay. Um, well, just to add to that point, you know, I think, and, and Albert, this is a community, maybe something, you know, it's, we can all think about in my interaction, as I said, when we were working to set people up and we got a lot of calls from folks from skilled nursing facility, they've been alone for a year and they're struggling on their own because like they're trying to set up, but there's nobody there like a 15 year old one trying to navigate through the phone or through the laptop to set them up. And so many times it, the conversation takes a completely different turn. They just wanna to talk to somebody. It's like, cause they've been isolated for a year. So even though they call for a particular problem, a lot of times they just wanna to talk to a different person. As he pointed out, they've been locked up for a year. And sometimes you start smiling and they're like, oh, it's so nice to hear someone smile because when you smile, I'm smiling and I think something to think about, you know, like what is some of the things that maybe we can do and keep more engaged with those folks to this point, they've been kind of isolated or alone and they just want to expand that social circle outside of the people they direct, you know, directly, you know, live day to day. Thanks, Mila. Yeah, I, th I, I, I was gonna say before I got muted somehow, um, when you think about kids who go to school that aren't very social and so forth and sort of sit in the back and, and you begin to feel when you're going back from out of this in a way that you can't re-enter re that group of people again. It, it's, a, it's a funny kind of feeling because it's, well, I don't know whether I wanna do that or not. And, and it begins to make you think that way, which as a grown up is really kind of ridiculous, but, but somehow it's there for people who are kind of shy and, and you know, aren't in the mainstream of things. So Zoom has helped a great deal. Uh, and in all of this for communication between people. And I've, I've gotten a lot out of that. So it's interesting. I think, I think that these are incredibly important points. I really do. I think, uh, you know, ultimately it might be the most important thing with that we face, the most important challenge we face. And just to bring it back to, you know, the, the medical sphere a little bit, I think that one of the good uses of telehealth and telecommunication with your providers is to try to reach into your home and re-engage and reconnect with your own health care. Because I think that's going to be a crucial part of re-entering society is people feeling secure that their health is going to be secure, that they're not going to end up ill or they're not going to have a lifeline if they do become ill. So I, uh, you know, I, I think it's, like I said in the beginning, one of the silver linings of, uh, of telehealth, it allows us to communicate without actually being in the same room. And it's meaningful communication. I just want to connect one question that's come in from, um, from Hugh about, as we're thinking about re-entering, as parents and educators, what should we be thinking and preparing for in order to best help Philadelphia's children post-pandemic? As, as we're at the hour, if I may just say one thought about that, I, I, um, 
I, I think that uh, my, one of my learnings from this is um, goes back to one of the core learnings from the godly play curriculum that we have at our church, which is that um, we can't always protect children from the existential threats to anxiety. They're aware of them at an earlier age than we realize. They're well known, death, loneliness, freedom, meaning, those are the big four. <laughs> and the pandemic has really shown children um, about death and loneliness and freedom, like freedom from going to school. Maybe that's not so great. <laughs> and uh, meaning, like what is it that we're all supposed to be doing here? And children have a sense of these things. And I think adults have been forced in some ways to begin to address those existential anxieties with them. And I think that's one of the blessings of the pandemic because I think entering into those truths rather than pushing them away will build strength in children to deal with them post pandemic. And they may come out of this um, with more strength in the future than they might have without the pandemic. And so this is a this is a thing not to shy away from those conversations or not to think you have answers. A lot of times it's just a matter of listening and then asking them more questions rather than providing them answers, which I think is always best in these existential matters because I don't think there's any final authority except providing a, an audience to, to bear witness to their uh, communication. So thank you. So we are coming to the end of our time and I just wanted to say, because there are so many unanswered questions yet, we, um, I, I talked to the panel yesterday about uh, our great pain that we can't sing in church in the way that we used to. And we have been struggling as many faith communities have, there's so much a part of building community and so much a part of mental health and uh, doing things that, we, that, that gives us sustenance and so on. So, we're going to have another conversation um, here at St. Paul's that will focus in on aerosol transmission and music and, and how we can uh, both be responsible around that and what we can and shouldn't be doing. And I know, uh, Neil, that's something that you're concerned about a bit more. Is there anything you want to say on that as a kind of teaser for uh, maybe our next, uh, our next chapter on this? Sure. I, I've been thinking about that a lot since we spoke yesterday. I actually talked to my, my wife about it as well. Um, I, I think the teaser would be that there's hope um, and to for returning to some, um, some level of normalcy as the, um, as the disease levels in the community decrease, um, I think that it will be possible um, to, to begin to sing again, but, um, but we will need to make some accommodations um, for the disease, at least, at least initially. So we will um, let you know when we've got to schedule this and, and get uh, some folk in, but I just want to say how really grateful I am. And I know uh, on behalf of everybody who is being a part of this and watching this, we are not only grateful for the information that you shared with us today, but we are very grateful for your calling, your vocation as healers and uh, what a difficult year it has been for you. And we hope and will continue to remember you and your colleagues in our thoughts and prayers and anything we can do, please let us know. So can everybody just express their appreciation? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Bye. I enjoyed the Bye. Time. Bye. To be continued. Have a good week. Have a good week. God bless. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Bye.